Well, every year, our family tries to go on a camping trip. And uh, the place that we often go is in southern BC. And I, I've mentioned it before in other sermons, but uh, one of the things we like about this particular lake is that it's warm, it's clean, it's fairly shallow so that our kids can, can kind of go out a little bit from the shore, don't feel like they're pinned to, to the shoreline. It is also the type of lake that doesn't allow motorized vehicles, so you can swim really anywhere you want without really worrying about getting run over by a motorboat or a sea And one of the Sunday, one of the days that we were there, it was a hot, hot day, and and I was feeling ambitious that 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 morning or that afternoon, and decided, you know what, I'm going to try and swim across this lake. It wasn't a very big lake, and you know, I figured, you know what, I've seen other people do it. Surely I'm in better shape than them. Uh, and, and, I, and I, you know, they made it look easy, and so I figured, you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a try. And I got, uh, so I started swimming, and I got about halfway to the other side of the lake, and I realized, you know, this isn't as easy as I thought it would be. So every couple of minutes, I would swim, and, and I would catch my breath. I'd have to tread water in the middle of the lake, trying just to catch my breath. And in the meantime, I felt like the shoreline was actually getting farther and farther away, rather than closer and closer as I was swimming. And, and occasionally as I was swimming, just because of, out of sheer exhaustion, I couldn't, I wouldn't, couldn't get my head out of the water to take, to take a breath. And so I ended up like getting a big mouthful of lake water instead. And it just was becoming this really miserable, difficult experience. All of a sudden, though, as I was swimming, I suddenly heard this, Hey, Dad! What the heck? And I had to turn around, and there he was, my nautical savior. Silas had followed me on the kayak out, out to the middle of the lake. He just wanted to come say hi. It's like, yes, finally I'm rescued. He didn't know that he was rescuing me from drowning, but he just, because he just wanted to come say hi. But, so I grabbed onto his boat really quickly and, and just, come oh, on, good, glad that you're here, son. Good to see you. And, he didn't, and as I, after I caught my breath, I was able to make it to the shore. And, and I was like, forget this. I just walked back to the, back to the beach where we were at. But here's what I discovered from my little adventure out into the lake. One, that the lake was not as small as I thought it was. It felt like I had been swimming and swimming forever, and I'd only gone a fraction of the distance that I needed to go. Two, that I wasn't in near as, better, as good a shape as I thought I was. And three, that I wish I had put a life jacket on, because the swim would have been substantially easier if I had. Now this morning as we conclude our series on the breastplate of righteousness, I think there are some parallels to the life jacket that I wish that I had put on when I started my swim and the breastplate of righteousness that the Apostle Paul talks about in Ephesians 6. And for the last two weeks, we've been exploring the life of Job, who we read in chapter 1 and 2 how his life had been turned upside down. He experienced total financial devastation. His ten kids had been killed. He's covered in head-to-toe in painful sores. And then we read in the rest of the book of Job how his friends, quote-unquote friends, conclude that all of these hardships that he's experienced are a result of something that Job had done. And that because of that, God was now punishing him. What we discover, though, is that as Job's friends hurled accusations on him one after another after another throughout, every, throughout each of these chapters is that Job was innocent of all of these accusations. That Job was a man who chose to align himself with God and was seen as righteous in the eyes of God. Righteousness can be defined as experiencing God's pleasure. And we see in Job that God's pleasure, his righteousness, wasn't just because he aligned himself with God, but that, his, but that righteousness impacted the way that Job lived his life as well. He was living the right way, the way that God was pleased with. Which makes sense, right? If I decided to go swimming across the lake and put on a life jacket, but never actually went into the water, people would start to look at me and think, what, what is that weirdo doing? If I'm wearing this, this life jacket through the whole service, you think, what is he doing? Why is he doing that? There'd be no reason to, be, to, to wear a life jacket in church. Eventually, eventually, if in my case, I would start to wonder, is there any point in wearing this at all? Just like a life jacket, though, we put it on to use it, 
We put it on because we expect that it may be at one point or another that we may have to put it into practice, that we may actually have to use it. In the same way, a Roman soldier would put on his breastplate into battle. He wore it with the understanding that it would serve a purpose, that eventually he would need it. He wore it believing that it would do what it was designed to do as well. And that he, would, that he would actually be empowered to accomplish the mission that was before him. If a soldier, in fact, was lacking his armor, if he chose not to wear his breastplate at all, he would certainly be entering into the battle fearful. Instead, a soldier enters into battle. He enters into his mission believing that the breastplate that he is wearing both protects and empowers It empowers him, it empowers us into into moving forward, into advancing. Now, three weeks ago, as I introduced this topic of the breastplate of righteousness, I suggested that there was two expressions of righteousness. There was positional righteousness, where we actually put on the breastplate of righteousness through through the presence of Jesus in our lives. And the second is practical righteousness, where we see through Job that out of his righteousness is an application to the righteousness that he put on. It's an application of us aligning ourselves with Jesus, to actually putting those things into practice, to living it out. Job, who we've been studying for the last couple of weeks, is a man of character, strong character, a man who loves God. And we see that the first thing that we see in the book of Job is, is this beautiful description of, of Job. I would love to have that, this written on my epitaph. That he was blameless. That he was upright. That he feared God. That he turned away from evil. What a legacy, right? Where we see in that verse that positional righteousness actually comes with two distinct applications. Internal application and external application. Internally, we see his, his righteousness expressed through his character, where his attitude, his thoughts, his values, his beliefs were actually all in alignment with God, that he prioritized God in his life. How do we know? Chapter 31, verse 1, gives us a really, really great clue. Job says, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman, What does that have to do with God? On the surface, this may seem like some really great advice for a married man who wants to maintain his sexual integrity and purity. But it's actually in this verse that we get some of the the nuances of poetry in Scripture, where some of the language in the book of Job isn't actually talking about sexual purity in this particular verse. He talks about it, though. In verses 9 through 12, Job says, If my heart has been enticed by a woman... Or if I have lurked at my neighbor's door, then may my wife grind another man's grain, and may another man sleep with her. For that would have been wicked, a sin to be judged. It is a fire that burns to destruction. It would have been, it would have uprooted my harvest. Here he's, that's, that particular verse, he's talking about sexual purity. He's talking about being faithful to his wife. He's talking about sexual integrity. But that previous verse, chapter, verse 1, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. Seems pretty blatant, doesn't it? Most commentators, though, think that what, that, that what Job is talking about here is actually related to his own spiritual purity. See, culturally, Job is communicating his outright rejection of the widespread pagan worship that existed in Uz. At this particular time, we know that pagan worship was based around the worship of fertility and sex. So why is this important for Job? Why is this important for us to understand? Why is Job specifically addressing his rejection of paganism in this verse? So let's put ourselves in Job's shoes for a moment. Here we have a man who's lost all of his livestock. He's lost all of his crops. He's lost all of his children. How tempting would it have been for for him in that moment to reject God. To look at his circumstances and say, God, you did this. And point the blame at God. Say, forget you, God. And completely abandon God in that season of suffering. 
But it's in these moments that we see Job's internal righteousness at work. Think about the allure of this temptation. That maybe the God that he worshipped, maybe, maybe that God's not as powerful or kind or as good as maybe that pagan goddess is. I see other people in my, in my in, in ooze who are blessed, who have their crops, who have fields, who have kids. You know, maybe if I worship her, maybe she would be the rescue that I needed in this moment of crisis. Maybe the pagan worship of the day would be able to restore my crops. Maybe I'd be able to get more livestock if I worshipped her. Maybe if, if I worshipped this goddess, that she would restore some honor to me by producing more kids for me. And all he would need to do was give in to the escape that idol worship had to offer. But instead, we see Job using covenantal language here. Because I made a covenant with my eyes. He's communicating the commitment to God, his, commu- his commitment to God in spite of his circumstances. Where he has positionally put on the righteousness of God, and now the application of that has given him the resolve to resist the allure of these idols. Righteousness aligns our internal attitude, our values, with God's, and then invites God into it. Now, when I was swimming across the lake, it was hard enough as it was without a life jacket. But you know what, you know what would have made it harder? Carrying rocks in my shorts. That would have made it harder. Obviously, if I had rocks in my pockets, that would have impacted my swimming. And it would have been silly for me to continue the swim with rocks in my pockets. Can we agree on that? Sometimes we have things in our lives that impede our progress that prevent us from doing the things that God wants us to do internally and externally. Sometimes we need to put off the old way of life and instead replace it with the way of Christ so that it actually lightens our load rather than burdens it. Where we put on the breastplate of righteousness by making an intentional decision to put off the old self and put on the new self. Put on the breastplate of righteousness that guides our lives. When we reject the stuff in our life that weighs us down, the rocks that are in our pockets, the stuff that Satan would use to distract us, we discover from Job is that <clears throat> we discover from Job is that living out our righteousness isn't something that, that can be manufactured, but instead it's something that is released through the way we live our lives by putting off our old way of life, by rejecting that, by saying I'm not, I'm no longer going to carry the rocks in my pockets any longer. Back in June, I preached uh, from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 to 31, where we, considered some, where we considered how Paul gives us some ideas on how we can throw off the old self, how we can get rid of the rocks that we carry around, how we can get rid of some of the burden that, uh, that becomes an obstruction for us to do what God wants us to do. This is what he says. Each of you must put off falsehood. Speak truthfully to your neighbors. For we're all members of one body. In your anger, don't sin. Don't let sun go down while you're still angry. And don't give the devil a foothold. Anyone who's been stealing, don't steal any longer. But work. Do something useful with your own hands. That you, that they may ha- that you may have something to share with those in need. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who are listening. And don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all the bitterness and rage and the anger. Get rid of brawling get rid of slander and every other form of malice. Just dump those rocks out. So instead of lying or anger or bitterness, instead of stealing or laziness, instead of hoarding or speaking foolishly or fighting, Just get rid of those rocks that are holding us back. And instead, put on the righteousness that God talks about in in Galatians 5. It says, instead, instead, put this on instead. This will help your swim. Put on love. Put on joy. Put on peace. Put on patience, goodness, and gentleness. 
put on faithfulness and self-control instead. Let these actions of righteousness that we choose to put on instead, let those things be our actions. So how do we do that then? How do we apply the righteousness of God in our own lives and live in such a way that reflects God through our lives? Well, Job shows us that there's an internal and external reality that is important to God. That it's not just important to you and I, but it's important, it's, it's, it's important to us because it's important to God. Where we put off the old self and we put on the new where the righteousness that we put on becomes the lens in which we live our lives. Because the truth that we put on is leading and directing how we interact with God and interact with others. The struggle, though, is that just like crossing a lake, it's a slow journey. It's difficult. It's not always easy. We can't just blink and say, I'm a cross. Often the, the destination is much farther away than any of us really, really want. It's not something that happens in, immediately. But there will be times when we discover rocks in our pockets that we forgot were there. Oh, oh you know what? there's some bitterness in, in here. There's some hurt in there. There's some greed or there's some lust or there's some selfishness that I'm, I'm still holding on to. And these rocks can begin to, to drag us down, to hold us back from experiencing the full righteousness that God wants us to experience. And what we can you do is we can say, we can either identify them and say, these are just things that are just the way, that's the way they are, and they're going to just continue to drag us down. Or they can be reminders to us that God is not finished working in us yet. We see in Job that it's more than just behavior modification. It's more than just looking good on the outside, looking spiritual but from a distance. But instead, we discover that the breastplate of righteousness is a permanent fixture in our lives that leads and directs and prioritizes godly behavior. We see from Job 31 that one of the ways that Job externalizes his righteousness is by the way that he cared, prioritized the, for the people around him. This is what he says in verses 16 to 23. If I have denied the desires of the poor or let the eyes of the widow grow weary, if I have kept my bread to myself, not sharing it with the fatherless, but from my youth I reared them as the father would, and from my birth I guided the widow, if I have seen anyone perishing for lack of clothing or the needy without garments, and their hearts did not bless me for warming them with the fleece from my sheep, if I have raised my hand against the fatherless, knowing that I had influence in court, then let my arm fall from the shoulder. Let it be broken off at the joint. For I dreaded destruction from God, and for fear of His splendor, I could not do such things. What we see in these verses from Job is this major theme of selflessness, where he put others ahead of himself, the impoverished, the widows, the hungry, the orphan, the cold. Essentially, we see how Job's uh, ex external expression of righteousness was to care for the marginalized. Where we see that in spite of Job's affluence, that his righteousness did not allow him to be apathetic to the needs of others. Instead, Job used what God had given him to serve others and help the disadvantaged in some very practical ways where we see that the application of righteousness isn't just for our own benefit. It's not just for us as a church, but that it actually impacts others. So there's an impact that ripples into the lives of other people. When you and I put on the righteousness of God and live in the way that the Spirit compels us into, it changes us and it impacts others. Our eyes begin to shift from ourselves to others. Where we actually begin to look for opportunities to help. Can you imagine for a moment as I'm swimming along in the lake and Silas says, Hi, Dad. Seeing me gag and, and barely stay afloat, he just keeps paddling by. Meanwhile, the rocks in my pockets are weighing me down and I'm just struggling to stay afloat. Can you imagine if he was paddling by and says, good luck, Dad, or it's not my problem. 
or as he's paddling by, just said, take the rocks out of your phone pockets, dummy. Or as he paddled on by, and said, my thoughts and prayers are with you. And just kept on sailing by. None of those things would really be helpful in that specific moment of need, would it? Instead, I think we model the righteousness of Jesus when we start to look for the best way to help others out. Because maybe God has actually sent you into that person's life for a reason. Maybe you guys, maybe you've crossed paths with someone to help them with a need. To walk with them in a difficulty. To help them swim across as well. You see, Jesus was all about looking for, was all about looking for the most practical ways to live out his righteousness in our lives and meet the needs of others. One of the ways we can live out the righteousness of God is when we can love others the way Jesus did. Where it shifts from an internal righteousness to an external expression of righteousness. So here are three simple ways that I think we can externalize the righteousness of God in our lives so it transforms us and impacts others. One, empty the, rocket, empty the rocks in our pockets. If you have rockets in your pocket, take those out too. Each of us might have areas of our lives that are holding us back. Maybe different areas that are providing resistance or drag as we try to make the long swim across the lake. For some of us, maybe it's fear or control or self-righteousness or arrogance. For others, it's selfishness or apathy. Today may be a time for us to ask the question, what are the rocks in my pockets? David writes in Psalm 139, Search me, God, and know my heart. As we begin to ask that question, search me, God. God, inspect where the rocks are. Help me to identify where they are so I can get rid of them, so I can dump them out. James chapter 1, verse 21 and 22 says, here's what we do once we've done our, our heart inspection. It says, get rid of all moral filth. So don't hold on to it anymore. Don't say, okay, I found it, and then put it back in your pocket. Get rid of it. Get rid of the evil that's so prevalent. Instead, humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. One of the most effective ways to get rid of it, we also find in the book of James in verse 16, chapter 5, verse 16. James says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So, one of the first things we do is dump out the rocks. So we do that by taking, by taking the first step is by asking for help to take the rocks out of our pockets. Sometimes we're too busy with everything else. Sometimes we just need to ask for help. Someone that we can trust who say, just help me with this. If someone was struggling in the lake, and they were being weighed down by their rocks and struggling to just move forward. I suspect it wouldn't take a second thought for any of us to do whatever we could to try to help that person, would we? It wouldn't be a matter of judgment or fear. You can't swim across the lake. What's wrong with you? But instead, our response would be a matter of compassion and love. To help rescue someone by helping them dump out the rocks that they're carrying with them. So empty the rocks. Two, put on our life jacket. Just like Job, who acknowledges a temptation to worship other idols but rejects their allure. When I was a teenager, uh, one of the things that I was often guilty of was, was snacking in my room. I'm sure there's no teenagers who are guilty of that here. But as a teenager, my room was in, my, was in the basement. And so I could have all the snacks that I, that I wanted without mom and dad knowing. Hopefully they're not watching today. But often I would, I would, on the way home from school, I'd stop at the 7-Eleven. I'd grab a Slurpee on the way home. And, and I'd go right to my basement and I'd, and I'd start doing homework slash video games. And, 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 or video games and then not homework. Uh, and over time, though... The, the collection of Slurpee cups in, my, in the basement in my room began to accumulate. 
Not sure if you're aware of this, but after a few days of, of festering Slurpee cups, they become like a Petri dish. And they start to ferment. And it actually begins to become quite alluring for uh, little creatures like ants and fruit flies. And I even think I may have had like, a, a, mos- a mosquito nest in, in, my, in my room. By leaving all this garbage lying around them, it was basically an invitation to come on in. Make yourself at home all of this nonsense. Because here's the thing. When we live unrighteously, when we live lives that are unpleasing to God, it's like keeping all of that garbage lying around in our lives. And it just attracts all kinds of unpleasant, unpleasantness. It's basically an invitation for Satan just to come on in, make yourself at home. When we make the willful decision, though, to put on the life jacket, to put on righteousness, to put on God's pleasure, not only does it reject the devil, but it aligns ourselves with God. I'm just clearing house, and I just want to be with you, Jesus. I want to live in the cleanliness of being with you, Jesus. When we align ourselves with Jesus, it transforms things. It doesn't make the journey shorter or mission less daunting. But at least we can know that there is strength that comes from knowing Jesus in the midst of the journey. Don't just put on the life jacket like I'm wearing today and just stand on the shore. Put it on so that you can use it. Put it on so that you can know the fullness of what it means to run the race with Jesus. Empty the rocks, put on our life jacket, and lastly, start swimming. James chapter 1 says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Don't just read the Bible for the sake of just checking it off your checklist. Read it so that it changes you. Read it so that it it impacts the way that you live your life. Read it so that it impacts and changes how you think and believe, how you interact with God, how you interact and treat other people, even those people that you may not like or agree with. And if you just need to read the same verse over and over and over and over again, until it's finally set in and you're finally doing it, then do that. It's not a competition to see who can get through the most Scripture. It's about living it out. We read the Bible not so we can get spiritually bloated on God's Word internally, but instead we read it so that it changes us and shapes our lives so that it can be applied in everything that we do and that we can actually begin to live it out externally as well. Worship team, you guys can come on up here. I want to read from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. That's what it says. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by such by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Dump those rocks out. Let us run or swim with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We know that Job's life was a difficult one. We know that he faced challenges. We know the mission God calls each of us into isn't always easy either. We know that when God called Job to swim across the lake, that Job didn't know it would be as challenging as it was either. But he did it. And God was with him when he did it. He wore the righteousness, the breastplate of righteousness, that, that, and knowing that God was with him, he put it on himself. And as he, and as he, as he ran the race, he cried out to God in the midst of his suffering. But he kept swimming. He kept moving forward. He kept advancing He lived out our righteousness that God was pleased with him internally and externally. Let's pray.
God, we are grateful for the opportunity you give us to, to grow in you, Jesus. And Jesus, we pray that, that as we consider what it means to put on the righteousness of God, that you would begin to help us to live it out. That even now, God, if maybe there's things, there's rocks in our pockets, the things that are holding us back, that are, that are dragging us down from accomplishing your mission, would you give us the courage to be able to identify what they are and confess it, to ask for help, to call out for help? Jesus, we know that you are faithful and good and that you can and you would rescue us. Help us to, to, to find the courage to be able to ask for help now, Jesus. I pray that as a church that we would be a community where people could come and know this is a safe place for us to all to acknowledge the rocks in our pockets, but also acknowledge that we need our dependence on you, Jesus, to rescue us. Our desire to hear your voice. A desire to seek after you. A desire to pursue after your will, Jesus. So Lord, as we, as we strap on the belt of truth, as we put on the breastplate of righteousness, we go this morning as, as celebrating who you are. We go this morning in the confidence that, that you are with us. And we live our lives accordingly. I pray this in your name.